Hello everyone, clinicians, and welcome to another endodontic management of the medically compromised patient. Today's topic is the diabetic patient. I'm joined by Dr. Ian Grayson, postdoctoral fellow at postdoctoral endodontic program at Harvard School of Dental Medicine. Uh, Ian, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Ian, we're sitting here in the Boston Common. Uh, beautiful day. There's uh, the walk for uh, cancer and the Jimmy Fund is going on in the background. And uh, what better location to talk about something that requires a lot of outdoor activity and a lot of physical activity, and that's diabetics. Uh, so you have a case for us, and um, you're going to talk about the case first, and then we're going to talk about some of the potential uh, ramifications of the medical history. So why don't you get started and talk about the case first, and we'll go from there. Sure. So our case today involves a 53-year-old African-American male who was referred to us for endodontic treatment of tooth number 19. His past medical history showed type 2 diabetes, which was fairly well controlled. Uh, he had a history of hypertension. He had a resting blood pressure of 140 over 90. Uh, he had no other complications, and he had an HbA1c of 6.0. Uh, in terms of his medication, he was taking metformin, which tends to decrease glucose synthesis within the liver. He was taking Lasix, which is a diuretic, uh, also a tenolol, which is a beta blocker, which tends to slow his heart, and Lipitor, which is a statin for reducing his cholesterol levels. His past dental history involved uh, tooth number 19, which was restored approximately six months prior to him coming in. Okay. Now, when we did our clinical exam, we found that tooth number 19 had a very, very deep distal restoration, and upon extensive testing, we made the diagnosis of irreversible pulpitis. So the pulpal diagnosis is irreversible pulpitis, and the apical diagnosis at this point is... It was uh, asymptomatic. Basically. So what we devised was, we devised a treatment plan involving this endodontic treatment to be form, performed in two short appointments, both in the morning. Our first appointment would be to clean and shape up to a number 35.04 in all the canals and place an intramedicament uh, medication of calcium hydroxide. The second appointment would be to remove the calcium hydroxide and obturate with gutta perca and BC sealer. Terrific. I can see that you got a very nice outcome. You uh, filled the tooth uh, very nicely up to the apex and everything went well. What did yep. you do for the follow-up? Uh, in the follow-up, uh, we made sure that the patient had adequate anesthesia for all the procedures, and we'll discuss why that's important for these patients later. He tolerated the procedure well, and his symptoms subsided, and he's now quite comfortable. Terrific. So this brings up the topics that we're going to discuss, obviously highlighting diabetes as a, uh, as a medical condition and how it relates to the clinical management of these patients. We can talk about some of the physiological manifestations of diabetes. How do we make a diagnosis for it? and then some of the oral manifestations obviously that are very important and it relates to dentists, um, general dentistry as well as endodontics, and then also treatment uh, considerations and precautions. But uh, let's first talk about diabetes and what is it? What is diabetes? Um, we're we're going to go through an overview here. It's not going to be really, really detailed, but generally speaking, diabetes is a metabolic disease which is characterized by high blood glucose levels over an extended period of time. There are three major types of diabetes that we generally deal with. There's type 1, type 2, and gestational diabetes. Now, when we specifically look at type 1 diabetes, type 1 diabetes is characterized by a lack of insulin production by the beta cells within the pancreas. And the majority of these cases are due to uh, an immune-mediated disease, uh, which involves the T cells, the unregulated T cells. Now, the function of insulin is to stimulate the uptake of glucose into fatty and muscular tissues. It also tends to inhibit the breakdown of glycogen in the liver and stimulate the storage of glucose in the liver. Yeah. It affects both adults and children, but most commonly affects children, therefore called juvenile diabetes. And certainly there's a hereditary component involved with this disease. It's often characterized by very large swings in glucose levels of the bloodstream. So what are some of the common systemic manifestations of uh, diabetes that we see in, in patients? Uh, the most common ones that we would see, uh, it's associated with hypertension or high blood pressure. It's associated with glaucoma, uh, high intraocular pressures, retinopathy, uh, a decrease in the uh, neural supply to the retina. It's also associated with peripheral neuropathy, so there's tingling numbness in the extremities. One can also notice vascular changes, especially in the lower extremities where you have peripheral vascular disease. For us, it's very important to note that if there's poor resistance to infection with these patients and they also exhibit delayed or decreased wound healing. 
And what about orally? I mean, obviously, those are the systemic uh, complications and uh, potential uh, problems. What about in the oral cavity? What do we um, see? Pertaining to what we do in terms of oral uh, complications, the two most common conditions we see are gingivitis and periodontitis from an oral complication point of view. It also involves salivary gland dysfunction, and with dysfunction of salivary glands, you'll get uh, xerostomia and the potential for high caries rates. Now, susceptibility to oral infection, both of a bacteria and fungal nature, are also present, and it's often common with these patients to see candidiasis. When you look at these patients, um, the reason for this is with the immune system, there are microvascular changes, so we can't get the immune cells to the area we need to get them to, and we have a decrease in some of the immune system components, namely the PMNs, which have a chemotaxis problem, they can't be attracted to the site of infection, and with the macrophages, they have an overall decreased function. Often with these patients, we can see cases of burning mouth syndrome, mm -hmm. and that's generally due to the neuropathy. Yeah. So what about, so that was type one, uh, clearly, as well as you can see in type two as well, but what is more specifically, what is type two diabetes? Uh, type two diabetes usually takes place or comes on later in life. Um, it's associated not so much with insulin drop off, but with the inability of the receptor cells to be receptive to the insulin. And generally speaking, it has both lifestyle and a genetic basis for this disease. And risk factors for type two diabetes involve obesity and diets high in carbohydrates and saturated fats. No, absolutely. And I think this is specifically, this type is the one that where good um, healthy kind of lifestyle. healthy lifestyle and lots of exercise and so on comes into uh, comes into effect, which is kind of Definitely. why we're showcasing this. And at the end of the video, we're going to probably uh, put you in we uh, a for a little surprise. We're going to a little surprise for you guys too. So stick around. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead. Let's talk about gestational okay. diabetes because that's also... Gestational diabetes is diabetes um, which takes place during pregnancy. And it's a transient nature, very, very similar to type 2 diabetes. And and after uh, certainly certain conditions, uh, postpartum, it tends to disappear. Yeah, clearly, we talked about type 1, type 2, and uh, gestational diabetes, but how do we make a diagnosis for a diabetic patient? How do we know a patient has diabetes? Well, there are generally two types of uh, tests that we do in order to ascertain diabetes. The first one is, is a plasma glucose level, mm -hmm. and this is determined during a glucose tolerance test. Any reading above 200 for this certainly is a risk factor for diabetes. The second one, which is more common, or more widely used, and more accurate, is the glycated hemoglobin HbA1c test. This is a better test because it involves testing over a much longer period of time, and any level over 6.5 will indicate a pre-diabetic state. Yeah, I mean, I think the the, the fasting um, uh, treatment, uh, the fasting glucose test, was something we did in the past. Now that we have the uh, glycosylated or glycolated, uh, yeah. or several different names, the H1c type yeah. of a uh, a test available which uh, spans the whole lifespan of a red blood cell for for uh, the per persistence of any um, high glucose level in the blood we have a much better way of testing in patients uh, you know before it not gives just us a, a more accurate exactly way. over yeah. the time so we have a patient that's diagnosed what are some of the treatment options for such patients well the different diabetes are treated differently. Type 1 diabetes is generally treated with insulin injections. It must be injected because mm -hmm. it's very poorly absorbed orally and with different types. There's the slow acting, the longer acting type of insulin and the patient can be on either or a combination of both of these. And type 2 is generally treated with lifestyle changes and you can uh, certainly follow that up with an oral hypoglycemic like metformin which tends to stop the breakdown of glycogen in the liver or they're often taking a drug called glyburide which can influence the pancreas um, and increase insulin uh, directly by doing that. In terms of uh, treatment considerations, um, the most important thing is a good medical history because in this type of disease, um, the preeminent, the preeminent uh, factor of it is the degree of control of glucose levels and good glycemic control is paramount in this and if you do you're not going to get a lot of the manifestations that you see with the disease. Now when you're examining a patient if you see uh, cases of xerostomia, candidiasis and there's no reasonable explanation that patient should immediately be referred to his physician for further testing and to evaluate the levels of glucose within his blood. Patients who are under good control and don't have any complications, they can be treated and handled as with any other patient. However, 
patients uh, should be treated in the morning and the morning treatments are very beneficial because that's when glucose levels are highest and insulin um, activity is lowest. So that's the best time to treat these patients first thing in the morning. Absolutely and they have also a higher level of stress hormones so they're much better able to deal with, with, with stress and so on as well. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the considerations that we need to keep in mind for diabetic patients? Well if you're treating diabetic patients um, you should always have on hand very um, high glycemic index uh, fluids, uh, orange juice, any kind of carbohydrate beverage, beverages are very, very good to have on hand. Um, if you're performing uh, root canal treatment, either surgical or non-surgical treatments, pretty important to premedicate them with antibiotics because of their propensity for infection. Um, if you're going to perform periapical surgery, periapical surgery, it's very important to have their blood glucose levels within a good range. If it's not and they still require the surgery, a hospital setting would be indicated in that particular set of circumstances. Now, one more quick thing that I want to add is anxiety levels. With these patients, it's very important to control anxiety levels. So very good general anesthetic, if necessary, um, a forms of sedation are very good because what happens is when you get the endogenous release of cortisol, it's also associated with a release of high glucose within the blood and that can offset everything. So very important to control the patient's anxiety if it's present. Just a quick thing though, in terms of the uh, the use of antibiotics, as, as you know, I'm not a big fan of using antibiotics for all the other side effects that they have, which are now we're discovering more and more. I think what you were talking about is, is we're talking to give the antibiotic to a patient with diabetes who's really completely out of control. Yes. Is a high risk for right. potential infection. Not that every patient right. who has if diabetes they're, if they're very well controlled, they don't automatically require antibiotics. Yeah. Certainly, um, if they're not well controlled, then you should as a precautionary measure. Yeah, Definitely. absolutely. I, I agree. A, a much older patient who's got a number of other problems uh, and is diabetic that is not controlled might benefit from it. But otherwise, I think that uh, we really should curtail the use of antibiotics to those cases that are really absolutely necessary. So we talked about insulin shock brings up that's that's one of the main issues, uh, considerations for all uh, dentists, endo versus uh, restorative, everybody. That's the one, the number one emergency kind of a yeah. thing that you see associated with a diabetic patient. Can you tell us a little bit of what insulin shock is? And uh, Sure. Um, insulin shock is, is probably one of the most serious complications that you're going to have to face when you're dealing with these patients and it generally results from a very rapid fall of glucose within the bloodstream and you'll get symptoms uh, such as sweating, uh, confusion, dizziness and seizures and essentially when something like this occurs uh, you always have to assume that it's hypoglycemia unless otherwise proven and in order to treat this kind of condition if the patient is conscious, you, you can put him supine, you can give him oxygen, and certainly by mouth, you can give him um, any kind of high glucose beverage. Now, if the patient is unconscious, um, you want to call 911, um, and certainly IV dextrose, which is a sugar solution, uh, can be given. And generally speaking, if the diagnosis is correct, this condition should resolve itself within 10 or 15 minutes. So if you see an emergency patient, chances are if a patient's passed out, you're going to have to assume insulin shock rather than diabetic coma. Right. You go that route and you see the results and then proceed from yeah. there. Uh, patients that have diabetes also require lots of ongoing care and they are under ongoing care. What are some of the considerations? Well, in terms of considerations, uh, we want to monitor uh, all caries, periodontal disease, periapical lesions. These should be treated more promptly and more aggressively than the average patient um, and if necessary antibiotics should be given but certainly the cause of these uh, conditions should be treated as soon as possible. Um, you can start by educating the patient. Um, very good oral hygiene and regular dental care is certainly important for these patients and it should be stressed in combination with a very heavy, healthy lifestyle. Now educating the patient once again is the most important thing and that's good all around because it allows them to be more vigilant and potentially catch very, very small things before they become larger things and present serious problems. You're absolutely right. I think, like anything else, as we have kind of covered so far in the past, uh, and the like management of medically compromised patients, communication is again a key. Considerations of some of the medical uh, side effects of their uh, the, of their systemic disease, such as diabetes and xerostomia, for example, which will cause a patient to be not only uh, more 
um, exposed to infection due to the diabetes uh, and the immune considerations there, but also to caries because of xerostomia requires us, it's our responsibility to communicate this to patients, not just fix a tooth that has a cavity, but communicate to them their, the importance of the need to have increased uh, you know, oral care in order to make up for the deficiencies of their saliva and the other considerations that they have. So these are all very important considerations. Communication, again, is number one, and number two is for us to know what are the potential problems with a given patient. Now, as the church bells are going on, so I think we're coming to the end of this. However, we want to also uh, emphasize the importance of, of, uh, uh, of, of a lifestyle change, not only in terms of diet, but also in terms of exercise. Right, and right. in terms of exercise, a great exercise is something I know you're really good at, and that is uh, squash. Well, no, I, I try hard. And I try hard. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Grayson is a wonderful squash player. So I uh, wanted to do is uh, bribe my racket here so we can take this uh, onto uh, the, we're going to go to my gym here. I'm going to do a little bit of squash and share a that with you guys. A little yes. demonstration of what it takes to sweat and get into shape and uh, do what we gotta do. So Ian, let's get going. Okay, I'm on it. Thank <laughs> you.